Hi, everyone. Welcome to our 61st session of Main AI. Today, we have David Ouyang from Sina Sinai with us to present his research, Development to Deployment of Cardiovascular AI. David is a cardiologist and researcher in the Department of Cardiology as well as Division of Artificial Intelligence in Medicine at Sina Sinai Medical Center. As a physician scientist and statistician with focus on cardiology and cardiovascular imaging, he works on applications of deep learning, computer vision, and the statistical analysis of large data sets within cardiovascular medicine. As a clinical echocardiographer, he works on applying deep learning for precision phenotyping in cardiac ultrasound. Additionally, he is interested in multimodal data sets linking ECR, echo, and MRI data for a holistic look at cardiovascular disease. He majored in statistics at Rice University, obtained his MD at UCSF, and received postgraduate medical education and in internal medicine, cardiology, and a postdoc in computer science and biomedical data science at Stanford University. Thank you for joining us today, David. Before we start, could you let us know how and when you want to take questions? Yeah, uh, thanks, Easy, for the introduction. I, I really appreciate questions in the middle or whenever people have an interest. I'll kind of monitor the chat and also if kind of someone raises their hand. I do find that, kind of, you know, I was at Stanford two years ago and really appreciate kind of uh, the uh, lively back and forth often that can occur with uh, conversations. and. I wish it was easier with Zoom, but I think that you know over the last two years we've gotten um, quite familiar with uh, doing this uh, kind of over Zoom as well. Sounds great. So everyone, let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. Without further ado, let me hand it over to David. Sounds good. So um, you see, as um, really appreciate the invitation. I'm really excited to be here. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a cardiologist by background and really all focus on kind of cardiovascular imaging as a uh, platform and as a opportunity for uh, development and deployment of AI. So what I'll really talk about is discovery, which I think that probably most people in the audience here to already know much about and why deep learning is really exciting. I'll talk about efforts that we've done in collaboration with uh, people at Stanford, including James and Ewan, on developing kind of AI and cardiology. And we'll also talk about our recent efforts to deploy these technologies in a clinical setting. And if there's time, also talk about um, ways we can use these technologies for disease detection and hopefully identify things that cardiologists might have missed. So first, um, even stepping outside of um, AI, I would say that there's a common phrase that's a picture is worth a thousand words. And this is inherently true uh, in many forms of medical imaging. On the left-hand side is actually a paper or a picture published in the New England Journal about 10 years ago. And this is actually a picture of a truck driver where over the course of 20, 30 years of driving, maybe the same time each day, there's asymmetric sun exposure. And this actually causes a very different phenotype uh, from the left side of the face versus the right side of the face, which we can recognize visual imaging, but oftentimes we might use more complex forms of imaging um, in healthcare. But ultimately, we care about the phenotype not for its own sake, but because it has a relationship with a clinical outcome. In this case, potentially skin cancer or kind of untoward um, blemishes or things that are related to the skin. The reason I point to this picture is this really speaks to some of the opportunities as well as some of the limitations with medical data. You could imagine that someone could look like this and come to my clinic or other clinic, uh, but that a lot of that information is not distilled or is missed in the EHR because ultimately um, we don't necessarily want to spend uh, kind of hours writing a novel or describing every single feature. But also that this highlights that there's so much information in the images that aren't fully captured and potentially AI is a really great way to identify those relationships. As a cardiologist, we know a lot of relationships. So how well the heart function, the ejection fraction, the coronary calcium or how bright the heart arteries are or the, how much contrast the DGE there is on cardiac MRI. These are all metrics that cardiologists and clinicians have come up with to quantify how strongly the uh, assessment is or how strongly there's a clinical phenotype. And cardiologists obviously care because it has a strong clinical outcome relationship, whether it's heart failure, whether it's 
heart, uh, heart attacks or whether it's even cardiovascular mortality. But ultimately, these are only a small sliver of the relationships that probably we can capture and we can know. So that in many cases, potentially AI can allow for a unbiased uh, kind of general approach where we can find additional stronger relationships with some of the clinical outcomes that we ultimately most care about as clinicians as, as well as patients. And this is that idea where there's a, essentially, this is an iceberg. Um, a lot of the medical labels are just at the tip of the iceberg, but there's so much relationship with kind of both phenotype as well as disease that we hope that we can uncover with AI. Ultimately with this idea, um, we actually see that in at least in cardiology and true in many other forms of medical AI, um, that there's been tremendous research work um, in cardiology, whether it's EKG waveforms, so the actual pictures of EKGs, not the structure information, on echo, the cardiac ultrasound, or CT, as well as nuclear or MRI. Uh, all these modalities show that there's additional value to be obtained if we can actually use complex algorithms to derive um, some of the key metrics, as well as come up with novel relationships with imaging. So ultimately, the vision of my lab, as well as what I imagine many would resonate with many of you guys, which is machine learning of cardiovascular imaging can provide for precision phenotyping, more precise phenotyping that provides additional diagnostic utility, knowing what diseases there are, as well as prognostic utility, which is what can happen to the patients in the future. And to put it simply, can we do things that humans do, uh, but can we do it faster or can we do it more precisely? And can we also start interrogating what computers can do that humans cannot do or relationships that humans have missed? So um, going back to the idea uh, that humans are fallible and that includes clinicians, one of the key metrics in cardiac ultrasound or even in assessing heart function in general is something called the ejection fraction. This is a inclusion criteria for all heart failure clinical trials. How, whether a patient has heart failure or not often is predicated on whether the ejection fraction is normal or abnormal. Yet, despite how important this is, and this is the gatekeeper to therapies and devices, um, human inter-observer variation is up to 10%. Meaning this is enough variation that can go from having disease to no disease, or enough variation that it goes from mild disease to even moderate or even severe disease. And this is an area where um, despite this, these pitfalls and despite these challenges, um, this is an important clinical metric. And the way I describe it is like, if you look at the left-hand side, ejection fraction is simply the ratio of the heart size at its biggest versus at its smallest. And ESV, EDB means volume at its biggest and smallest. It's a continuous variable. So it makes a lot of sense that you know, humans aren't stepwise. There's not like, I'm more likely to be 180 pounds as opposed to 181 pounds or 172 pounds versus 180. But when it comes to assessing ejection fraction, we ultimately actually come up with a much more um, stochastic and much more um, imprecise measure where you can see highlighted in red are, are all these numbers where it go, it's usually a metric between kind of zero and 100. Um, but we're seeing that clinicians often are much more likely to say it's 85, it's 55, it's 50, or it's 45, as opposed to saying 52 or 51. And this really speaks to how much imprecision there is and how much subjectivity that allows for us to really only put ejection fraction in buckets. Ultimately, we see that the human element is the biggest source of variation. And this is work that um, we did last year where we actually looked at, because this is the ratio of the biggest or the smallest in a video, um, choosing even the slightly different frame, which frame of the video was the smallest, which frame of the video was the biggest, can cause the ejection fraction to vary a significant proportion and actually really adjust or really change kind of what our assessment up to kind of eight or 9%, which makes a big clinical difference. That human variability is also true in almost every facet of both cardiology as well as medicine. I would joke that if you went to three different cardiologists, you might get four different if, uh, results. Um, but ultimately this is true for imaging as well. And this is true even for cardiac MRI, which is, has prettier pictures and has a clear boundary of what's kind of the beginning and the end of a lot of measurements. But even in this assessment, and this is a paper that was published in Lancet Digital Health by researchers in London, that this has a lot of variation based on how humans assess 
where to start and end a segmentation, where to do the linear measurement that causes a lot of variability that ultimately actually trickles down to significant changes in patient care. So about two years ago, um, we worked on using video-based models uh, for assessment of this ejection fraction, the LVEF. This is work done by myself, uh, Brian, uh, as well as kind of Ewan and James, and many names that you guys know well at uh, Stanford. Uh, but really our idea was that we can use these models that are obviously could work very well in computer vision. Some of them are um, more common, uh, obviously kind of image-based models are more common, but given that Echo is a video using kind of video-based models with kind of a 3D inputs as opposed to 2D inputs, uh, makes a lot of sense. But we can use this to go after the regression task of the ejection fraction, that number between zero and 100. And we can also use that to identify heart failure and we can use it to be more, potentially even more precise than humans. The reason that we think that it can be more precise than humans are twofold. One, ECHO has a lot of variation. So you can see that there's both good quality images on the left, as well as poor quality images on the right, where it is on the right, especially with poor quality images, it can be more subjective. It's really hard to know where the volume ends and uh, starts and ends. But even in these challenging settings, with enough training examples, we can show that the AI is able to pick out the boundaries and come up with a consensus view. And two, it's incredibly laborious to actually measure ejection fraction. A sonographer or a technician or a cardiologist will actually have to trace every frame of the video to come up with a consensus measurement. The reality check is that realistically, most times in clinical practice, we don't do that because it's so laborious. There's maybe 200 frames. No one's gonna trace all 200 frames of a video. Um, but we choose a representative frame. We only choose systole and diastole, the biggest and the smallest. By creating a model that generalizes and automates a lot of this, it's naturally easier to come up with a more precise consensus measurement. And this is really true in a lot of heart diseases where actually every single beat might come up with a different number. And ultimately for something like atrial fibrillation where there's so much variation on how much inflow there is and how much uh, filling time there is, having that average number allows for a more precise and more consistent number. Whereas if a human or a clinician is able to uh, do this assessment, they would often choose just a representative beat and that can have introduced variation of itself. That said, even though we're making the claim that we think that this AI is better, um, this is an area where we thought that the bar is still relatively low for the deployment of AI. Right now, if you talk to the FDA or if you uh, want to see this in deployment, the background or uh, the opportunity is still a little bit unclear. There's definitely places that are more interested in AI, less interested in AI. Um, but a lot of what the FDA does for, say, drugs or therapeutics um, is not necessarily how they handle AI. An example I give is that kind of if you were to start a new medication, a new therapeutic, uh, you need kind of phase one, phase two, phase three trials. You need to uh, be blinded in most cases, and it almost certainly has to be prospective and most vast majority of time randomized. Um, but this is not true for FDA clearance of AI technologies. Um, in James' group, kind of Eric and Kevin actually did a review uh, now a year ago where we looked at all the AI um, essentially clearances of AI technologies by the FDA. Very few multi site studies. 98% only use retrospective data, so just collection of data sets from multiple sites. And then this brings in the question of is it an option for cherry picking or overfitting? And essentially, none of these AI technologies ever underwent a randomized trial or a blinded trial. And this is really ultimately, as a clinician, the bar that I hope to see um, before adopting or using any new technology. So, uh, may I ask a question? Yeah, see. Um, so David, as, as a clinician yourself, um, like how would you trust this, this uh, FDA approved devices if, if they are built on like retrospective data and non-randomized? Yeah, I think that this is really an area where you're seeing that most commercial offerings are not seeing much traction. I think that most clinicians don't trust them. Uh, and I think for good reason. I think that ultimately uh, it's an area where you know, there's a lot of VC money and there's a lot of interest, um, but ultimately the adoption for a lot of these kind of what I would describe really great technologies is rare and few and far between. So we're not seeing as much deployment, uh, even though I think that there's a lot of opportunity. 
-hmm. Thanks. Yeah, and you know, I think that this often uh, people ask me, what about interpretability or other approaches there? I would give the framework of, if you look at therapeutics, we might have an idea of how drugs work, but ultimately it's the bar of whether it works or not in a blinded, randomized fashion that is the threshold to decide whether it works or not. And there's actually many drugs where we don't know how it works. You can call them equally black box. For example, anesthesia is used millions of times every single day. And you know people fall asleep and really depend and trust their lives with it with undergoing surgery. But really, there is no mechanistic understanding of how anesthesia works. Yet it's FDA approved, yet people use it day in, day out, and it can be safe and reliable. But really, it's a place where there actually needs to be prospective testing, something that I think that ultimately that's a bar that AI hasn't necessarily met most of the time. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, with this motivation, that's why we started the Equinet RCT trial. Uh, this is a trial that uh, we undertook this year where we actually um, had a couple of things that we wanted to introduce in a prospective evaluation of, of our model that was published two years ago. First, we wanted to introduce blinding. You know, because obviously there can be bias either for or against the model, depending on whether you like AI or not. We wanted to do it in a randomized fashion so that we can actually normalize or erase out some of the uh, confounders that can happen in a non-randomized fashion. And ultimately, we also wanted to actually introduce the idea of an active comparator. I think this is a piece where, you know, to really understand whether it is uh, helpful in the clinical workflow, we wanted a comparison actually with skilled clinicians and with the ability to actually see it in true clinical practice. This was uh, presented at ESC, uh, kind of European Study of Cardiology Congress so, uh, in August, um, but I'd like to walk through some of the results now. So first, um, as a little bit of background for cardiac ultrasound or echo, there's three main phases. A sonographer or a technician scans the patient. This usually takes about 15 minutes uh, of an hour long test. Second, oftentimes in many settings, the sonographer produces the initial assessment so that when the cardiologist reviews this, um, they're not looking at it without any annotations and without any measurements, but often these skilled sonographers actually will do the initial drawing of the tracings for a fraction, as well as wall thickness and many other adjudications. This is an area where we thought would be really great as an opportunity for randomization. Uh, because this is an area where there's two blinded independent evaluations. First, uh, at CEDARS, we actually enrolled or asked a lot of our really skilled sonographers to participate in this trial. So this was kind of a uh, 25 sonographers with a mean of 14 for one years of experience. And then the ultimate evaluation were by cardiologists, where, where they were 10 and about uh, 13 years of experience. In this setting, the way that the trial worked is that we actually got sonographers to scan every single study and then trace every single study. Any studies that they can't trace was excluded from randomization. Uh, so this is the run-in period, just to show that the images are enough high enough quality that a human can evaluate it. But of the set that are human evaluated, they were randomized one-to-one -one so that we either erase the sonographer interpretation and introduce an AI interpretation, or we catch the sonographer interpretation and then presented all of these studies to a cardiologist. And the primary endpoint is how much do the cardiologist change the initial study, of which we assessed as substantial change where the EF changes by more than 5%. Um, I have a quick question here, David. Yes. So is the output of the sonographer, um, like the basic the, the thing that goes to the cardiologist, is it going to be just the annotations or do they also provide a report or a summary of what their findings are or what they think? Yeah, in the traditional clinical workflow, it is both. Um, but the EF, while an important measure, is only one part of the study, or sorry, one part of a full clinical report. This piece, we ask them to only do what they would normally do for EF and not worry about the rest of the report. Um, but what the initial interpretation comes up with is both the annotation as well as the metric of ejection fraction, which is again, a number between zero and 100. I see. And so the output of the, uh, the sonographers basically annotate and then give a number for your EF and then the AI does the same thing. So that's what the clinicians, the cardiologists actually look at. Exactly, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'll, I'll show it in the next uh, couple of slides. Um, but the first piece is like kind of what a cardiologist usually sees 
is what looks like on the right-hand side. Here's an annotation where there's a tracing at two time points, the largest and small, systole and diastole. And this, these tracings actually get fed into a, a, essentially a software that kind of algorithmically, so I would say um, deterministically assess the ejection fraction. Based off of these tracings, the computer comes out with a number that's ejection fraction, in this case, kind of an EF of 62.89%. In order to blind uh, cardiologists for our AI arm, we actually had to reproduce and create the same tracings. You can see that kind of on the top left, that's what the model output does look like. But instead of actually tracing every single frame of the video, we're only going to show them one frame or two frames, one at sleep, one to sleep, and it's going to be shown in exactly the same way. And this is work that was done. Um, all the heavy lifting technically was done by Brian Heaton, uh, and we'll show you a little bit of his code in the next slide, or a little bit of the output. So. We're using a software called Siemens, which is the clinical path system. On the left-hand side, you can see that there's two sets of annotations or tracings. And then this on the right-hand side is the ejection fraction. These tracings are done by a human, and you can see that they're actually traced, and you can see that's what the cardiologist would see. Brian ran some code, and in this unblinded session, you can see that this actually introduces two new sets of tracings. So these are another set of tracings that are actually introduced by AI. Um, at the cardiologist time point, they only see one set, but what they're tasked to do is actually to adjust this if they feel like it's an incorrect measurement and ultimately change the number uh, uh, or adjust this so that the ejection fraction number, which uh, shows up on the right-hand side, changes to what they think is true. And the sec last piece before go talking about the results is that we also um, because we wanted to do this safely, we actually didn't re or scan new patients, but we actually used historical images. So that kind of these are actually images scanned by the sonographer uh, in 2019, August of 2019, and then were actually retraced by a sonographer and then randomized to AI or sonographer. The reason why we chose this design is that by using the historical uh, study and the historical images, we actually have another point of comparison, which is what ultimately happened in the clinical report, which is kind of traced by sonographer and then uh, confirmed by cardiologists. So this, I would describe in red at the bottom, is it actually a test of human test retest. So even if you take out the AI arm, if it was just the sonographer arm, about half the studies, this would be the largest study comparing what does it look like when two different cardiologists uh, assess the same study over time. And so ultimately, we started with about 3,800 studies in August of 2019. About 6% uh, were unable to be traced and had to be visually estimated, so were excluded. So that uh, approximately um, 3,500 3, studies underwent randomization. And this resulted in 1,740 studies randomized to AI and 1,755 randomized to sonographer. The patient population represents the patient population at Cedar. So on average, about 66 years age, about 60% male, um, a, the majority white, but also a, a large black and Hispanic and Asian population, and also a lot of comorbidity. So patients who get echoes tend to have more cardiovascular disease, tend to have more diabetes, to have more hypertension and AFib compared to a general population. And these are the qualities of the echo that were obtained from the historical report, where kind of, you know, some patients might have great quality images, some might have adequate, and some might have good. And this is a, a set of studies that are both inpatients as well as outpatients. So the echoes are obtained in the hospital or in the clinic. Before I talk about the first primary outcome, um, maybe I'll talk about the blinding, because I think this is important to contextualize. So in the middle are the videos uh, that were uh, these four chamber videos that kind of the cardiologists saw. And then they only saw one set, but in this slide, I showed you kind of two sets of here's what it looks like uh, for a, the sonographer as well as the AI to trace it. Um, since kind of, I think there's not many cardiologists in the audience here, I'll not pause too long. But we can see that actually um, cardiologists aren't able to guess or assess what the agent was very well. 
so that actually among the 3,500 studies, about 1,100 or 30, uh, one third were actually guessed correctly. So it was AI and it thought, they thought it was AI versus actually one fourth were guessed incorrectly. So they thought it was AI, but it was actually a sonographer or they thought it was a sonographer, but it was actually AI. And about 45% uh, of the time, they just weren't sure. It's really hard for the clinician or cardiologist to tell. So we used a metric called the Bangs Blinding Index, which was 0 0.088, where a metric of zero would be perfect blinding, and a metric of one would be uh, imperfect or perfectly bad blinding, so always knows it correctly. And that generally a metric between negative 0.2 and 0.2 is considered good. So this is well within the region of considered good blinded uh, clinical trial. Uh, so what does a negative number mean? Like the, you said what is zero and what is one, but what is negative one? Yeah, so negative one would be they're always incorrect, but that would still be not blinded, right? So like if it was AI every time, but they always guess sonographer and they flipped, that would give you a metric of uh, one or a negative one. Okay. So that even if you're perfectly correct or perfectly incorrect, um, that would be considered not blinded. Um, but a range kind of, I would say, between negative 0.2 and 0.2 is considered good because you're really close to flipping on point. Sure, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in this blinded set, uh, setting, um, we actually saw that the AI performed well. So the primary outcome was kind of changed from initial to final assessment. And in the AI arm, about 17% of the time was substantially changed. In the sonographer arm, about 27% of the time. Um, this was actually uh, powered and designed as a non-inferiority study, meaning that we were hoping to show that least equivalence. Um, but this actually met that equivalence or non-inferiority endpoint, as well as uh, essentially a statistical test for superiority, uh, which is showing that kind of this is actually much less frequently changed in the AI arm. The mean absolute change was on the order of 2.8% versus 3.8%, which is also statistically significant as being superior. The secondary outcome of that final report versus the historical report, substantially different, 50% uh, of the time with AI, so and then 55% of the time with sonographer, still statistically significantly better. Um, but that ultimately is a mean difference of 6.3% versus 7.2%. And remember, at the beginning of the talk, I talked about historical uh, studies suggested that the difference uh, assessed is usually on the on the order of 10%. So this really describes that kind of, in general, the cardiologists are quite good, um, but this is still a relatively imprecise measure because there's this degree of variation. When assessing time, you can tell that obviously AI requires zero time by the sonographer. Um, but it actually saves kind of cardiologist time because they trace it less or need to adjust things less frequently. So about 54 seconds versus for the sonographer, it generally takes them about two minutes and it takes the cardiologist about one minute to adjust or adjudicate uh, whether they agree or disagree. And of any change, it was about 63% of the time versus 69% of the time. Um, I had a quick question here, David. Yeah. So um, how sensitive, like how precise should these measurements be for the cardiologist for the, you know, a downstream like pre a treatment recommendation or something? Like, does it matter if, if like we are super precise either with the sonographer or with the AI or is, is the range really the, the thing that cardiologists should look for? Yeah, that, it, this is a really great question. Often medicine is done at thresholds, right? Normal, abnormal, or mild, moderate, or severe. Mm -hmm. Those buckets tend to be kind of buckets of 10% or so. Um, but I think that the most important piece is when people are at the cusp. Like, is this kind of mildly reduced or mildly weak versus actually relatively normal? Um, I would say that kind of changes less than 5%. I would say there's probably not much of a clinical change at all. Um, but this is, as you point, appropriately point out, actually a lot of times clinicians have to look at the images themselves to really assess, do they really think that a clinical change happened or just the measured metric is slightly different? I see. In that context, would um, like is, does another sort of metric kind of make sense where you see um, if you maybe look at the same image through multiple models or through multiple cardiologists, do they give a final different outcome? If, if something is like, <laughs> if one image has a lot of differences, then maybe that's on the cusp versus one which is like getting the same 
prediction every time like maybe it's it's in one of those um yeah like the normal parts of the bucket i don't that, know if that that's a good point that's a good point so i think that there's maybe two pieces there one is like the human to human variation where it's <laughs> imprecise but the other assessment is like as i mentioned in uh this figure which is like um even uh, in the same video every beat might be slightly different and that's mm -hmm. just part of normal uh changes in heart function like your heart function will just look different if you're walking versus running versus mm -hmm. standing still and if you have um heart rhythm disorders uh, that can change uh essentially just every beat looks slightly different and on the right hand side here this is i would just say can frame b you can see that kind of even across the different beats this one is assessed that like maybe 65 this one would assess that maybe 60 and 50. um that is really some of it attributed to just how different every beat of the heart looks and every um, beat can have a different uh, ejection fraction i see okay gotcha yeah. thank you but that said i think that for some hearts that are fairly regular it should be essentially the same all the time so like this is showing that for this patient that the heart is not that is pretty normal um you should be getting a pretty good point estimate all the time i see would it be fair to conclude um i mean not not fully conclude but at least get an estimate like by looking at these graphs if there is like a significant change in the prediction it, you need to pay more attention to it versus if it's relatively stable is there some sort of conclusion that you think cardiologists could draw or is that still pretty variable yeah absolutely i i can totally agree i think that you'll naturally see more variation on a lower quality image and you'll naturally see more variation when there's heart disease or other areas mm -hmm. where like things like AFib and stuff like that. Um, but ultimately, I think that these are picking up areas where I think that probably the clinician be, should be extra careful. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. And so I would say that kind of in full disclosure, there are limitations of the study. This is single center. We were only able to deploy uh, one place at Cedars. Um, in order to do a true comparison, we wanted to blind. And in order to blind, the AI is weakened such that we are only showing the model output for one frame or one beat as opposed to multiple, which we obviously with software is very easy. There's no comparison with cross-sectional imaging. So oftentimes people will talk about the comparison with MRI or CT or other ways to assess ejection fraction. And ultimately, uh, going to a lot of your point, is we do want to assess how important it is to be more precise. Does this actually change clinical management? Is Are we actually able to do things better for patients when we have a better assessment of reduction fraction? That said, this is uh, an area where we think that uh, we are really kind of still quite proud and happy to present the results. Um, it's an AI model where we have publicly released code and representative training data. So working with kind of CURD and the Amy Center, we've been able to release uh, a lot of the training actors. Um, but similarly, like I think that for mo many AI projects, uh, not yet releasing code and not yet releasing data, this is an area we hope to kind of be lead by example. We think that this is strong because this is true randomization with an active comparator. This is not an area where there's a, a weak com comparator where the comparator is truly the clinical workflow with kind of really good sonographers. The blinding was successful. Cardiologists can't tell whether it was AI or sonographer. And ultimately, even taking outside the AI piece as a cardiologist, I'm quite interested in essentially clinician test retest, which is how much variation there is. And, you know, as we dig more into a lot of medical research, we do see that there is a tremendous amount of variation in clinician. And this is true in many facets of healthcare. So I will pause here if there's any other questions about the trial, but then I'll probably pivot to a, one final piece of uh, research. Um, I had one question, like not really on the methods, but just more on a general topic. Do mm -hmm. you think, um, so I guess ejection fraction at least um, has been like, it, it's been consistent throughout the ages. Are there like some treatment changes or protocols that have been changed over the years where if you do a historical testing, like current cardiologists might choose to do something differently compared to previous um, equations? Is that something that can come into account or are, are, are things pretty much stable throughout the years? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So um, 
Ejection fraction is how one defines and determines if someone has heart failure. That is one of the most prevalent diseases uh, and kind of a big burden of both mortality and morbidity in the US. Uh, it's a, an area where the treatments have obviously changed a lot over time so that um, if there's a reduced ejection fraction, the medications we give, um, there's actually many treatments for and many ways that our treatment has improved over time. And similarly, uh, the way that we assess ejection fraction has also changed with the with prevalence of more cardiac MRI, you know, 10, 20 years ago, there are very few people with that. Um, even an echo, how we measure it. Previously, kind of we might have done linear measurements. Now we're talking about kind of 2D and 3D measurements. The assessments have definitely changed over time, uh, but it is an area where it's hard to directly compare a lot of these metrics. So, for example, I would say that kind of people often think of MRI as a good reference standard, um, but the temporal resolution of MRI is much less than echo. And we've talked about kind of, we've shown in our experiments that even if you, uh, that temporal resolution is actually really meaningful, even if you actually slightly choose one frame before or after of a video that drastically changes the assessment fraction eject, uh, evaluated, that it really becomes an apples and oranges comparison when you compare with other uh, imaging modalities. Gotcha. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So the last piece that I want to talk about was this idea of precision medicine which is, you know, uh, we have a lot of new therapeutics, which are tremendously useful, but we also want to focus on precision diagnosis. Obviously for ejection fraction, we have an assessment of heart failure, um, but many times in a busy clinical practice, we might not be able to spend as much time as one would like to really tease out some subtle findings or findings that are really hard to know for sure. One example of this is a disease called cardiac amyloidosis, which causes really thick heart muscles and causes heart failure, um, but uh, has been relatively underdiagnosed and is considered a rare disease. So often is not on top of mind for uh, clinicians kind of day in, day out. And some studies suggest that like for, to get a diagnosis, oftentimes patients will see uh, maybe an average of four specialists and it takes about two to three years before they can finally clinch that diagnosis. And by that time, the disease has often progressed. We've uh, essentially used some of the toolkit that we've really discussed for ejection fraction, um, but created a two-step model to assess for cardiac amyloidosis as well as phenotypic mimics. The first is that I described that this is actually a disease of wall thickness increase so that we actually create a more precise measure of wall thickness. So similar to ejection fraction by averaging over many beats and using a semantic segmentation model, we can actually come up with a more set or uh, precise assessment of wall thickness. And this uh, allows us to detect kind of, I would say changing wall thickness probably sooner than traditional methods. This compares favorably to clinician test reader test retest, where kind of we compare kind of um, what it looks like when patients or when clinicians often look at the same patient over time versus using an AI approach where you can see this is a scatter plot. And for the same measures, we would, if we were infinitely precise, it would just be that x equals y plane. And we'll say that there will naturally be variation, but using AI, we're actually closer to that than using uh, kind of clinical traces. But after identifying the population of patients with thick heart muscle, um, we can then actually identify what the etiology is, the kind of high blood pressure, other diseases like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, the auric stenosis and other diseases can cause uh, thick heart muscle as well. Um, but by training actually a CNN on the essentially four chamber view, um, we think that it can pick up uh, information about the motion as well as information about the texture that really helps us tease out what the specific disease is. And this is an area where um, we've published this uh, earlier this year, but wanted to highlight that um, in comparison with a lot of other models, we're choosing the patients with LVH or thick heart muscle first, and then teasing out which cause it is. A lot of other, um, I think, studies have tried to just go end to end, which is choosing kind of um, doing a model training where there's essentially all abnormal hearts versus age matched, uh, age and sex matched controls. In this approach, um, it's actually a very easy task because it, it'll, they'll just look so different from normal age and sex matched controls. There'll be not thick hearts at all, um, but really that ends up being a, what I would describe as a wall thickness classifier as opposed to an amyloid classifier. 
by us using essentially controls that are other types of hypertrophy. So uh, the HCM, the AS, the hypertension as the controls for our amyloid, we're bucking them all together and hoping that the model learns texture and motion-based features that don't relate to the wall thickness. And we show that in this area are nominal AUC drops, um, but we're hoping that this allows for a more uh, specific algorithm that we think that is more useful clinically. And we're actually deploying this prospectively as well, in which kind of we've actually looked at uh, a lot of the CEDARS data, and we're actually scanning through all the echoes, uh, coming up with a ranked list of how likely we think a patient has amyloid, and actually going back and either assessing their chart or calling them up to see if we should be screened for cardiac amyloid. This is something where um, it is really important um, because the relative number of patients diagnosed versus the population prevalence based on studies is much less. So we think that this is a, uh, while still a rare disease, a very underdiagnosed disease. So there's a lot of patients that are walking around probably not knowing that they have cardiac amyloid, but have features that are suspicious for it. And what I will say that these are some of our preliminary results where kind of on the x-axis is the model output that goes between zero and one. And on the top is actually our histogram, which shows that you can see that the vast majority of patients are close to zero, so unlikely to have amyloid. Um, but we see that if we even identify the patients that we know have amyloid based on our chart review, um, many of them do have amyloid uh, when we actually look at uh, essentially the high kind of uh, model predictions. And our goal is to actually highlight the patients that don't have no amyloid so that we don't know them right now, but have that high prevalence, actually see if they deserve additional screening and be seen by a cardiologist to do the necessary assessment and testing to evaluate if they actually truly have amyloid. The last piece I'll describe, and I'll probably pause here, is that this goes back to the idea of like, are there hidden phenotypes? Are there things that potentially AI can help uh, busy clinicians uh, essentially identify that might've been missed? And also, are there features that essentially people don't recognize, um, but actually the, the imaging provides that information? And this is a place where I think that we're seeing uh, in other papers as well is that kind of medical imaging can identify sex as well as age, can identify kind of whether a patient has high or low hemoglobin or uh, lab tests uh, that are traditionally even not considered related to the heart. Um, but ultimately, there's a lot more information in the imaging yet that aren't fully captured. Um, as part of our work, and this is work that kind of Matt Lundgren and um, kind of currently Moss really helped us uh, champion is that we also want to release a lot of these data sets for researchers to use. And this is an area that we've been really excited that um, we've released the training data for a lot of our models. Uh, and this is essentially both training data as well as code for, with the goal and hope to really push this field forward as a academic uh, exercise. All right, and I'll probably pause here and uh, leave some time for questions. Great. Thank you, David, for the amazing talk covering a lot of exciting projects and even RCTs um, on cardiovascular AI. So before we go into quite Q and A's, uh, let's all give David a round of virtual applause. Thank you for the talk. Yeah, thank you. You're you're too kind, and thanks so much for the invite. And yeah, uh, is there any question from the audience? Feel free to speak up and ask your questions. Uh, hi. Uh, so I guess for your amyloid um, classification, did you use just single frames or um, like three channel images? Yeah, great question. We use three channel uh, videos as well. So we actually use the same model ar architecture as our EF uh, essentially classifier. Okay, thank you. Um, in your in your echo net and yeah, those models, um, when you train the model, did you what, what was the label like? Is it um, what was the video like annotated per frame, or is it just a like? Yeah, it, it's a great question. So for things like the ejection fraction, um, we have a label per study, and that these are actually um, I would say that kind of we do data augmentation where the inputs are generally. Um, the same input, but the videos themselves might have variable length. So we will 
uh, actually truncate and shuffle during the model training. Okay, I see. Got it. So David, thank you for releasing the data set. <laughs> but one quick question. So why you are only focusing on the AP4 views? Why you didn't study like any other views in ECO? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So we're gradually going through them all. So the most recent paper is that we released the parasitic long view. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. So I think that um, you know, we're at the same time working with different uh, views and kind of working through them. But you know, ultimately they have to be driven by projects. So the the hope is to release more data and to release more views. And how did you select the views? Like, um, do you like manually select the views or in Stanford? I I I never worked on Ecodata in Stanford. So will they have a, like a label for views or how you did that? Uh, they did not have labels. So we we have a deep learning classifier, and that was something okay. that we trained. Okay. So you actually trained another model to select the views. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, makes sense. I had a quick question. So um, I guess in, in your data set, which is great because you have such a large uh, resource and it's all labeled, um, is it, do you think there is scope for like things like self-supervision where you can get away with without having those labels but actually training um, on echocardiograms? And have you tried exploring any of those techniques and what, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I, I think it's, a, it's definitely a very, active area and it's definitely an area we're quite interested in. Um, we've done some work with contrastive learning in mm -hmm. this area. Um, but you know, ultimately, I will say that um, my general thought of the field is that even with self-supervision, it, it never beats truly supervised data. Mm -hmm. And as a clinician, it's probably easier for me to get larger amounts of supervised data than mm -hmm. to be very complex into self-supervision. Uh, I would say that kind of, you know, the the effort it takes to label, uh, say, like 10,000 videos generally will beat, I would venture to guess, many self-supervised approaches, even on 100,000 or even kind of a million videos. And I think that I that see. is an area, I think, of active research and definitely an area we think that is really cool. But I would definitely say that I have not seen a lot of these self-supervised approaches benchmarked with truly supervised mm -hmm. uh, data sets. But David, yeah. you cannot believe. Today, actually, I saw another PhD defense. I just came from another PhD yeah. defense where they show their self supervised. Semi supervised actually <laughs> perform worse than self supervised. <laughs> <Like, okay. laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Probably next time is we'll see like unsupervised will perform better than supervised. We'll see. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry, Nandita. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. Um, actually, on that thought, um... I was also curious, what are some other kinds of tasks that will be useful for cardiologists? Like EF is uh, like a great example where you are, you're actually segmenting out the, the heart, um, but what are other things that you can also use these AI models um, from this amazing data set, the data resource that you have collected? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question. There's, I think there's two broad strokes, right? One approach is that you can link it with EHR data and then you can do prediction tasks. And it could be end-to-end, -end, it could be black box, it could be interesting, um, but whether those diagnosis labels or diagnosis labels, lab labels, or demographic labels, that's one approach. Mm -hmm. um, that's an area where I think is, there's, it's definitely very exciting and there's a lot of opportunity, but is probably a little further from deployment compared to segmentation models, right? I think as a clinician, it's easier to say, oh, I agree with that segmentation or not. Um, the other piece, I would say that on the segmentation side, is that even though EF is really important, well, actually in an echo, there's close to 20 or 30 different measurements. There's measurements, so I'm really actually glossed over a lot of this, but all of these are measures of the left heart. There's actually measures of the right heart um, that we actually have a grant on and we're actually trying to um, essentially train models on and evaluate there. Um, but that ends up being a more messy area, mostly because I think the right heart is both less well imaged, um, but also because human labels of the right heart are more variable. So uh, I guess maybe this is an area, like I actually, as like you guys are talking about, maybe like self-supervision or, or semi-supervision is helpful, but how do you handle when the cardiologist variation is so much, and then you create a prediction that may be here, um, but do you say that that's true or not true, or how do you truly come up with that consensus? It ends up being an area where 
it's really hard to do too much work in an area where there's a lot of clinical variability. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Um, I have a general question about uh, explainability. So what's your, what are your thoughts on explainability and as a clinician? Um, are you looking, really looking for um, something that you can interpret um, from the model clinicians? Yeah, I think explainability is a great area and there's obviously a lot of work to be done. Um, I would say as a clinician, I just want to see that it works. You know, I see that this is, you know, that's, I think that everyone has a different opinion, but that's why I think that for most therapeutics, there's randomized and blinded trials. And even if we don't fully under, understand why it works, if it works, kind of people obviously will use it. And I think that even in an explainable model, if the explainable model, um, I think is brittle or the explainable model um, is not tested in the setting, I think it's still really hard to, I think, get most clinicians to use such a ML system. Yeah, but definitely um, as an area uh, outside of just ML for Health, um, understanding how these models work and recognizing when they fail is an incredibly important and useful uh, area. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, to give back to this question, actually. So is do you think a two-step method like you had done where you, you first do one thing and then use that for the other one is it's actually a step to not explain like get explainability fully but at least you know exactly this is the reason why it's going to the next step and so on so do you think that would that could potentially work instead of explainability methods yeah i think the the one area that I feel like I've been thinking more about is about like the data set construction. And obviously with the data set releases, that's been an important area. Um, for full disclosure, actually for the background of this paper, um, this was a paper that was relatively hard to get accepted because many reviewers were saying, well, your AUC is not as high as other papers in the field. Mm. And I think that that was an area where, you know, I think this is both true in ML as well as ML for health, where, you know, people are really synthesizing their understanding of a paper based off that like top number AUC, right? We really had to do a lot of convincing is that, you know, this is really because of the choice of controls or the mm. um, choice of the construction that ultimately we think that this is actually a more robust approach, but, you know, as a research paper can't prove that yet, um, but it is something that um, I think there's a lot of clinical shortcuts that can happen in a lot of kind of, uh, you know, AI and healthcare papers, right? Um, one thing I tweeted about recently was that there are a lot of papers showing that EKGs can predict uh, cirrhosis or liver disease. And that's an area that's quite interesting, but there is probably intermediate phenotypes. So ascites or fluid in the belly that is much more obvious on the EKG. Um, that really is what's being picked up when there's cirrhosis, but not ascites. Um, these models actually perform poorly, um, but really kind of, so a lot of these models like are the, the design of the question ends up being quite important in uh, how well the models work. That makes sense. Um, I guess if, if nobody else has a question, I still have one more, but I don't want to hog up all the time. So if anybody else has a question, please go for it. Okay, I guess I can ask yeah, mine. Sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess just before your talk started, we were talking about distribution shifts between institutions. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious about like, apart from institution-wise mm -hmm. distribution shifts, like what are the other kinds of like are, you know, the general physio like physique of the person, uh, maybe like people with bigger hearts, then they, there are lots of differences amongst people. And mm -hmm. so do you see these kind of distribution shifts being tested for as well as like how, how as a, like when you're thinking about deployment, it's kind of hard to know, okay, it's gonna work on every single case. So how yeah. do you actually test for, you know, what, what all possibilities can there be? Uh, where it might fail and how do you think yeah, about it? Yeah, that's a really great question, right? Because I think that it is, we are seeing many examples of a model that works well in one setting, work poorly in others. Mm -hmm. I think that our general approach has been in the model training augment in a way that simulates different sites. So that I would say that kind of, you know, I described Stanford and Cedars maybe use similar hardware, but maybe position the image in slightly different ways. So that as part of our model training, uh, we have a shuffler that actually adjusts kind of where the image is. Mm -hmm. I think that it's hard to 
you know, identify all the different ways that the the data can shift or the distributions are different. Um, but at the same time, I think this goes back to the question, like humans are not very brittle, right? If I practice yeah. here versus practice at Stanford versus practice uh, in kind of uh, sub-Saharan Africa, there are commonalities of human physiology. And that's what we're hoping clinicians understand. And that's what we're hoping that uh, essentially AI can understand. But, the, you know, the image quality, the I think the image position, those are things that hopefully can be solved just with really good data augmentation or understanding what are the common forms of data shift. Got it. And do you have like some data shifts that, you know, like that we already know that a model should be robust to when it's deployed, like when you're thinking about deployment? Yeah, I, I think that the the position and the frame rate, particularly for videos or the, the game or the, you know, how bright a picture is often mm -hmm. varies a lot. So those are things that we inherently kind of change and um, actually adjust for in the uh, the model. I think wow. like simply doing like a, a, a mean zero standard deviation one is not sufficient. And there's a lot of things to think about like what are, uh, even as you think about the workflow, how to actually kind of treat the, the same in pre-processing. Gotcha, thank you. All right, if there is no other questions, then thanks David again. And thank you everyone for joining us today. We will upload the recording of David's talk later to our YouTube channel and see you next week. Yeah, bye -bye. thanks so much for the invite.